You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Hello, world, and welcome to Tales from Hollywood Land, a veritable feast of movies, Broadway, showbiz stories, news and gossip with Julian Schlossberg, Arthur E. Friedman, and Stephen J. Rubin. Today, we look at the world of motion picture distribution and exhibition. And now, here's Julian, Arthur, and Steve. Hey, guys. I, I wanted to immediately defer to Julian because we lost a Hollywood great recently. And I know, Julian, you were very close to him. Do you want to talk a little bit about Don Murray? Oh, I'd love to, because he was one of the finest men I, I'd have ever met. Don Murray, as some of you know, was the co-star with Marilyn Monroe in his first movie, Bus Stop. He made Advise and Consent, Bachelor Party, uh, The Hoodlum Priest, and many other movies. His uh, mom was a Ziegfeld uh, girl. His dad was a stage manager. He was always involved in show business. But what people did not know, and he didn't let anyone know, really, he was pretty tight about it, was that he had gone over at the end of World War II to Italy to take help orphans and homeless people and work with them to try to get them back on their feet. During the Korean War, he was a conscientious objector, and yet he did all kinds of things, again, help people. He was not just a conscientious objector who sat home. He would also go, believe it or not, go to a leper colony and help people who were lepers. This is incredible man who had the heart as big as all outdoors, kind, loving, supportive, and I will miss him a great deal, as will the world, because he was one of a kind. So thank you, Steve, Arthur, and Mike, for letting me have that couple of moments to talk about a a fine human being. I wanted to give you a little historical aside. When I was doing the research for my combat films book, I was interested about the making of uh, The Young Lions, uh, which was a great movie from 58. In the early casting, the part that was later played by Marlon Brando, the German officer, Christian Diestel, was assigned to Don Murray. Mm. Was early casting was Don Murray in the Marlon Brando role and Tony Randall in the Dean Martin role. And, of course, that eventually didn't take, but uh, we got Brando and Martin. But I thought that was interesting. Also, Dean uh, Don Murray was married to for many years to a woman I had a huge crush on in high school, Hope Lang. And uh, I just, in fact, that I had such a crush that I had to use a gnome de plume once in some laser disc uh you know commentary tracks i couldn't use my own name and i took hope hope lang's name from her 1959 film the best of everything uh which was a fox title and her name in that movie was carolyn bender and i became carolyn bender well i will say quickly that uh i met don on my radio show he was doing same time next year uh a two character two-hander on broadway he had come in uh, as one of uh, the replacements, and the person with him was Hope Lang, even though they were no longer married. So they had be re- remained friends, and they had, of course, children together. And I want to just say one thing about Don Murray. He was in a, um, one of those movies that are like one of the great movies of all time. There are no lists called Advise and Consent. Uh, he was excellent in that, as he was in anything he ever did. But that's a great movie for anybody who's listening, Advise and Consent based on a top book by Alan Drury and a cast that's unbelievable, including the great Charles Lawton as Sieb Cooley, a Southern senator. And directed by? Otto Preminger. Otto Preminger, yeah. There you go. There you go. All right. And the other piece of news this week I would like to mention, because I'm very excited for all the casting directors in Hollywood, the Oscar Academy announced today that in 2025, there will be an Oscar for Best Casting, which uh, I thought was terrific news, although it probably really pissed off all the stuntmen because they also wanted an Oscar category. Well, eventually they'll get it. 
I think they will. I think like the U.S. government, the Motion Picture Academy works at its own pace. Yeah. And Marion Doherty should probably be awarded something in, uh, uh, posthumously. She was uh, one of, she was one of a kind. One of those. Very, very true. Well, she, today's topic is really important because I think like a lot of creative people or even just regular civilians who just love movies, we all don't really know much about the distribution and exhibition process. It's kind of a world which is uh, is a very important world for Hollywood, and yet it's not a very vocal world. You don't have a, you know, they, they'd rather interview Taylor Swift and talk about her performance in something as a musician or even as an actress and then talk to a distribution executive. So in, in our room now, we have two gentlemen who have worked in both exhibition and distribution. And uh, it's been very much a part of your lives, Arthur and Julian. I'll start with you, Arthur. Uh, you worked in, I think you start. you told me that you started your career, you worked in a, a record store in, in on Manhattan. Well, then, uh, let, let me see if I can interrupt here for a moment. Which I got to work with United Artists in 1964, right. one of the okay. major distributors, along with uh, Paramount, Warner Brothers, Fox, MGM, Disney. Julian, who am I missing? Warner I Brothers. Think, I think you got a wall now. You have the. You, know, you had you had uh, in, in those days uh, these majors, and today, really, they're, they're the same. Except there's a been a, a little bit of a blend. United Artists has become MGM. Um, New Line, which got into the game, has become Warner Brothers. Uh, and Summit became Lionsgate. They got into the game, too. Rarely did any um, minor or independent distribution company uh, get into the big game, which is, of course, the major distributors. So the way I would explain it is that uh, picture the motion picture business as a pie and slice it into three pieces. And in one piece, you have... Production, which we all are familiar with, is where the product is made, where movies are made, at studios or around the world. Uh, then you have exhibition, which, you know, nobody really, but that, that's the theater. You go to the movie theater, or in today's case, the streaming, that's the exhibitor. So you have production, and you have exhibition, which is basically retail uh, for the product, which is basically production. In the middle, there's something called distribution that to a lot of people, is kind of inside baseball, unless you're in that jungle. Uh, and distribution and exhibition are essentially the same because they deal with each other every day. Uh, that's the person in the middle dealing with the person at the end. Amazing how even some major producers and people in production don't know that much about what goes on in distribution. Julian, I'm sure you found that out, and as I have. Some do and, and, and some don't. Um, the distributor in the middle is so the question is what is what is what do they do what how does that work uh well the distributor of let's call it a major company uh are associated with the, the entire company with the studio they can finance a, a motion picture they can partially finance a motion picture they can just get a distribution fee for for a motion picture that's already been financed and they are they are the people who distribute that movie to movie theaters uh domestically and foreign there are two different worlds, domestic distribution and foreign distribution. And they get a fee, of course, for doing that. Uh, and they are wired into the world of exhibition, which is the retail. So the distributor is constantly dealing with the exhibitor. Uh, and um, that's really the business end of, of the movie business. Because where this, in making movies, there's a great deal of passion, uh, whether it's, it can manifest in, into arguing to love, to God knows what. But in distribution exhibition, it manifested to one thing, making money, uh, getting the best terms for the movie, uh, playing the best theaters. Uh, and uh, there are sometimes there are arguments. But in today's world, as again, Julian will know, and I think we all will know from just going to the movies, where it used to be that there were a limited amount of movie theaters that could play a picture example in any market you could have let's say 20 theaters but the distributor would say well we'd rather have just six theaters out of the 20 so you'd have to bid for a movie 
that was a tough game, which we can tell you all about. But that that was a very difficult ball game. Let me let me interrupt you just for a second, uh, Arthur, because you are very steeped in this. But I'm curious how a civilian off the street all of a sudden gets into the United Artists organization. I mean, this is a major film company. What did you were you touted by somebody? Did you meet somebody who got you that gig? What what brought you to their doorstep? Well, I was in the world of show business, uh, singing, writing songs and uh, getting somewhere and then not getting somewhere. And somewhere along the way, I, I it, the insecurities were overwhelming, which it is to most people, even those who succeed. And I decided to uh, get a job. Uh, and uh, I had a choice of going to work for either William Morris in those days as a junior agent or my brother, Bob, was a, an executive at the time for United Artists. He set up an appointment with me. And I met with uh, the, one of the, the uh, sales managers at, uh, at United Artists, and I went in as a so-called trainee uh, to begin. And that's how I got in. Otherwise, when I was a kid at a high school, I, went, I happened to walk into the building at 729 7th Avenue and looked at the directory and took and one of the first things I saw was Columbia Pictures. I went upstairs to Columbia Pictures at 17 years old, and I got a job in the mailroom. And that happens for so many people. Who, who become successful in, in, in the business. They start in the mailroom, agencies, uh, studios, uh, film companies. It's not a bad place to start. You, you, you see all kinds of things in the mailroom. And that's how uh, I, I started with Columbia Picture. And years later, that's how I started with United Artists, because then you go up the ladder. So Arthur, if he had been on a different track, Arthur could have been singing at the Hollywood Bowl this week, but he's not. How about you, Julian? Uh, I know that you worked for many years for ABC. Uh, you became very good at selling uh, or buying films, or was it selling films for them? I, I'm, I'm trying to remember. Well, uh, at ABC was my entry job as an right. entry. In it. I was not involved in the motion pictures. I was involved in television. Um, right. But let me let me also do what Arthur did, a little overview. Every company, every big company, even small companies have a production arm and selling arm and a way to get to the public. And the motion picture business is the same thing. In fact, at one time, the studios had them all. They did all three. They made the movies, they sold the movies, they owned the theaters. And that was a monopoly. And that was challenged in a case called the Paramount case. And the studios had to give up something. And they didn't want to give up anything, but they finally decided to give up the theaters. And they kept, to this day, the ability to make movies and to sell movies. So the distributor, as Arthur said, is the middleman. He's going to get that product, and he's going to make sure somehow he sells it to the public. My company, uh, first I worked uh, at, at Walter Reed, which was the theater chain that had 80 theaters around the country. And as an exhibitor, I would be buying movies for the theaters. As you guys probably remember, but a lot of young people, I hope, listening do have no idea, you open the movie often in one or two theaters in New York. That's how it started. It didn't go out to 1,200 theaters, 3,000 theaters. It went to one place, basically New York City and then L.A., and then it determined. What Arthur also said is true. The distributor has a lot of decisions how he's going to sell that movie. And I think Arthur can probably talk very well about just that. What is, you've got a movie, how are you going to sell it? They're not all sold the same way. They're all sold, in fact, differently. From Walter Reed, I went to Paramount. And what you asked, Steve, was often I would watch finished movies to decide, do we want to pick this up? It was really rare in the two years I was at Paramount that I found any movie that I wanted to pick up. And if I did occasionally, uh, I still didn't have the final say. I wasn't used to that. I had come from Walter Reed where I had the final say. So Paramount, I could say uh, no, and I could say I'll get back to you, but I couldn't say yes. So that encouraged me to leave. And I did and opened my own company, Castle Hill Productions, 
where we ended up with 500 movies. We had a very, very, very large library of independent movies, studio movies that reverted to the producer. And so the concept really of distribution and exhibition, again, as Arthur said, we're tied, they're tied very much together. That's how we met, Julian. It's true. That's how Me we and met. United Artists, you were Walter Reed. That's right. And uh, I'm very happy to say that we stayed together for 50, 50 plus years. years. However, right. yes. Long time. But but the, the, the most interesting thing for me is, oh, one of the most, anyhow, is how do you sell the movie? And that's, Arthur, where I think you can really come in because you were involved in doing <laughs> just that in the territories you handle, which were a lot. Yes. Um, first of all, decisions are made uh, along the line. Uh, when a movie is really in production, you begin thinking about how to market it. How is it going to be sold to the public? Uh, sometimes the movies, and today many times, are pre-sold. Uh, they're coming off of a franchise, uh, Superman 7, B Batman 12. Uh, so you know what it is. So it's a matter then of just pouring money in to television or internet or radio or billboards or anything that's out there that you can market and make the picture known to people. But the decisions become, you know, do you have a small movie? Do you have a, do you have a movie that you need to go out wide with? Meaning in today's world, as I said before, there used to be bidding and you'd play X amount of theaters in a zone of, let's say, 20 theaters, you want five. Today you play 20 theaters, but they pay for it. And the, the, the terms today are expensive. It's, it's, uh, if you're a theater owner, you're probably paying an average through the year of 55% for what you're getting. Uh, but you're making a lot of money at the popcorn stand and that's why you're buying into 55%. So you have more people come in so they can have popcorn, candy, in today's world, hamburgers, cheeseburgers, nachos, and God knows what else. And I, um, think, Arthur, you, I think, Arthur, you would agree that in most cases, the concession stand is what keeps the theaters going. You days. have to have it. You have well, to have let, it. Let me, let me dive a little deeper into that statement. What percentage of a typical movie theater's revenue is derived from concessions? Well, the, you, in the concession part of the business, uh, you're, you're probably making 80% out of the dollar of what you're selling. Popcorn is probably 95%. Uh, you're retaining 40, roughly, let's say 45%, uh, from the box office, a retention of 45%. Hopefully that will pay your rent, your insurance, your everything, your payroll and, and all the rest. And so the, the profit center is the concession stand. Which is true in many entertainment businesses, whether it be baseball, football, concerts. Uh, the concession stand is vital. Uh, major acts now, whether it be Taylor Swift or Barry Manilow, whoever it may be, uh, they travel with their own people selling the merchandise. The merchandise is incredible, uh, but you have to have popularity to sell merchandise. So you, you need to have a hit movie or a hit act or a hit baseball team or whatever it may be. Um, concessions are the profit centers in most entertainment worlds to the theater owner. Even on Broadway, Julian, have they expanded the, the concession stand in the theaters, Broadway theaters? Broadway theaters are almost non-existent, Arthur. It's because the ticket prices are so high, they don't even oh, need it. No, no, no. He's ta uh, Arthur's talking about movie, uh, actual legitimate theaters, Julian. I remember Julian as an example. I remember going in Boston to the Schubert or the Colonial or to the Wilbur, and they had these small stands, you know, little candies. If you were to, I, so I see. If you're talking about legitimate theater, yes, they they they're, they're not small. They're quite big, and in now they're cases, making money, yeah. many cases, honestly, they're a whole floor long. You go down to let's say the restrooms, and right next to there is a huge counter with. Everything, but mostly booze. A lot of booze are sold. Booze, yeah, yeah. Julian, don't they? Don't they have a? I'm again. This is me talking from the West Coast. Are you allowed to bring food into a legitimate theater? You're not supposed to. No, you're not supposed okay. to. I, I don't think it's really, uh, really policed that well uh, because it just doesn't matter. Uh, concessions are very strange too. Because if you're in, in, for example, in New York City in an east side theater, 
which plays a more sophisticated, intelligent film, concessions were never big. Action houses, big theaters, oh my God, that's where the money was. Uh, and it was enormous. We, we, for example, have the ass of the Victoria, the DeMille, and then the Ziegfeld, these big houses, and their concessions would be a big percentage, Steve. But if you're talking about, as we said, a, a more sophisticated theater, that concessions were not that big. Yeah, but they still buy popcorn and stuff. It's still it's it's not as big anywhere near as big, but uh, it's still okay. Uh, oh yeah, art houses, art houses will sell. And by the way, in legitimate theaters, my guess is that if they do buy the, the booze and wine and all that, I'm sure it's expensive. But even if they buy raisinets, I'll bet you the raisinets are five dollars instead of a dollar fifty or or something. All I can say is, if I buy a twelve dollar box of popcorn at the local uh, AMC. That popcorn must have cost the, the theater thirty cents, if that. Oh no, would thirty cents would, would would be way too much, Steve. All right, <laughs> um, but in Disney, when you play a Disney movie, you have that bonus of you're going to get lots of money from kids. Uh, they there's no such thing as taking a kid to a movie, a Disney movie, and not having them have popcorn or soda or whatever it is. So the, a Disney movie is worth usually more. Uh, when I say Disney, I mean like cartoon kind of movies, animated movies, uh, family kind of films are, are, are more valuable in a sense. However, the big action adventure pictures, uh, there you go. I mean, people are buying well, these things for, you know, $10. Arthur, Arthur, let me ask you a question based on one of your earlier statements. You mentioned the fact that if you're selling a movie to the studios, the distributor, can either buy it outright or they can take a distribution fee. When I sell, if I had a movie script with a director and a cast attached, I always assumed that the production people, uh, the creative people who run the, the movie studio buy it. But are you saying that the distribution people actually buy the film? Because I'm curious the difference between production and distribution distribution people will look into something called acquisitions which means they will go to festivals they will find finished movies that are not sold and they will try to buy that movie if they want it or compete for it uh that's one just one way that they they can go uh you worked on porky's two porky's one which was a huge hit was an acquisition Julian and, and a dear friend of ours, Norman Levy, was the guy who bought it, right, Julian? Absolutely. Bill Simon? Yep, yep. Yeah. So and Milk there's Gold different, thing. Ways, yeah. different ways to go. Or or you get a piece of your financing from selling uh, to the foreign markets. And now let's say you've got 50% of your financing from foreign up front. That's if you have a star or a major director. And then you want to go and you're going now to the domestic to sell off the domestic rights. U.S. and Canada, uh, and you're looking for half the money. Uh, but they may not want to give it to you. So it's a negotiation. They may want to give you 10%, but they're always going to get the fee on distribution. So, so here's a question. Um, the, the way I understand is if you send a script over to the studios, the readers will read it. The creative vice presidents will uh, have their meetings to discuss whether this is something they want to put into the pipeline. I don't think of distribution executives reading screenplays. I think of them buying finished films. You're right. Yeah. This, they don't get into, into that, uh, into reading. So scripts. that's a different, different side of the studio. That's where the product is. It's, that's, that's production. There are different departments in production. There are different departments in distribution. Everybody needs to know. It's distribution of motion picture. Also in distribution is marketing, advertising, publicity comes under that umbrella. That's what usually everybody working with the finished product. So in production, you're working with scripts or, or sizzle reels or trailers or whatever the person who's trying to sell you that product brings to the game. Uh, but the script will go to the production department in some form, uh, not distribution. Distribution deals with finished product, as does exhibition. They play it. Okay, so here's a question. If the production department picks up an original screenplay, let's say they pick up Rocky, and they're going to develop Rocky and make it as a motion picture. Does distribution have anything to say about that? Will they be in those meetings to say that yes, we should make Rocky? Well, let me let me let me at least answer one thing at a time, Steve. The when if you come in with a script to a studio, 
your chances are almost nothing to get it done. You have to have, no, the studio's got everything coming to them. You got to have a director attached, a couple of stars, something other than the script. Otherwise, the script's going to go to a reader. The reader's going to say he wants to keep his job. So if he keeps saying no, he's got a great chance because <laughs> very rarely do these films get made. The, 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 the distribution sometimes gets involved if, depending who's running the studio. When I was at Paramount, rarely did the distribution people get involved, but every once in a while, I remember when we wanted to bring back Star Trek, and that's when we got involved with distribution. What did the distributors think about making Star Trek into a motion picture? Because at that point, it was a dormant TV show as far as network, but was in syndication doing nicely. And I remember the meeting as if it was yesterday, because Frank Mancuso and I were the two people fighting to get a movie made of Star Trek. Of course, Frank Mancuso went on to run Paramount. Then he ran on, went on to run MGM, and I left. So <laughs> I think he did better. I'll tell you a, a good one, Steve, uh, that there's another thing called independent distribution, where you have small companies. In today's world, it's A24 or whatever it may be called. Uh, in our day, we were dealing with a company called New World. We represented, we, my company also represented independent producers and distributors. After you left, after you left United Artists. After I left United Artists, I had my own company and we got into all kinds of things. One of them was independent distribution, and we represented Roger Corman. That was an adventure. First of all, Roger Corman's a great guy, a very studious, terrific gentleman. But he always dealt with schlock. Uh, he dealt with, he would, the way he would, we would have sales meetings in LA. We, meaning myself and other sub distributors, we represented New England. There were people who represented the West Coast and the Midwest. And he'd gather all these people around, myself included. And Roger would bring out a one sheet of a movie that that wasn't even a thought and say, what do you guys think of this one sheet? And it was called Women in Cages with women in cages, half wearing dress. We think it's great. And he'd make it for like one hundred forty two dollars. <laughs> you know, he was making movies so inexpensively, very profitable. I don't think he ever made a movie that wasn't profitable, uh, but he had independent distributors. We were we were, as I say, you know, uh, it was territorial. Uh, and you would go by territory in those days. You would distribute a picture first in the West Coast, then in the Midwest, and then on and on. And you know how it was going to do kind of by how that went. Halloween was an independent film, guys. We had it in New England. It was a gold mine. And we didn't distribute it until late. That picture was out there in the world in November of 78. We didn't get it until March of 79. But we were the first company to go with that picture on a deluxe basis which you're seeing today, the, the horror business is today's goldmine. It's, it's almost like you can't miss. It's almost certain that if you open a, a horror movie on a Friday night, you're going to open to a lot of business. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a great genre uh, for profit. Uh, so my, my theory about horror movies is all about sex. And if you have a couple, regardless of their persuasion in the movie theater during a particularly horrific moment, somebody is going to reach for the other person and they're going to do a clutch and they're going to scream together. And that's that's how movies become successful in that genre. Yeah, well, the key word you mentioned was scream. It wasn't sex. It was scream. If, the, if you can scream like a ride in, in, a, in a park of, of rides, then you've got a successful movie as is the case of Scream. They made a whole franchise out of it. Uh, we had that in Halloween. So I never heard screaming like that in my life. I, so, I, so I'd like to talk about something that changed so radically that it, uh, we'll all can relate to, which was the 35 millimeter film print, the print that had to go out to a theater and how that was cumbersome and heavy and difficult and costing over, if you had a thousand prints, you could be spending a thousand per print. So uh, it's now changed to digital. You have an encrypted something called DCP, a digital. Uh, the film is there. It's very light, it's sent right out, and it changed the whole face of the movie business. Many of the theaters had to convert 
many of them fought converting because it was expensive. But of course, now it seems to be the case. That's a huge change. Wouldn't you say, Off? Well, yes. It happened in 2012. Uh, we had a theater uh, in Florida, a fiveplex, and it uh, cost, as I recall, $25,000 per auditorium to convert to digital. The, 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 the print cost was like getting it was $10. It became so minimized compared to what it was, as you say, $1,000 or more per print, unless it was Lawrence of Arabia and it was $1,700 a print. Uh, so that was a tremendous expense, especially when you were going with two, three thousand, uh, you know, prints for an engagement. So that changed a lot. Now they're heading into uh, laser and holography. And I cannot tell you what, what it's going to be in, in 10 or 20 years, but it may be somewhere where you sit in a movie theater and bullets are flying in front of your eyes. And it's coming from some kind of technology that we don't have at this particular point or we, we certainly have in mind. You know, there's always a story or two in every part of the motion picture business and probably most businesses. But one of the more interesting stories was the movie, the motion picture Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde opened. It opened pretty badly, and it, and Warner Brothers took it out of service. And Warren Beatty, the star and producer of it, went to Warner Brothers, convinced them they were not doing it the way it should be sold, and he went back, and it became a giant success. So uh, the distribution can change also. Uh, yes, but no. he did, did. There was a Pauline Kael, uh, I believe it was her, review that came very late in the game with Bonnie and Clyde and set it on fire in New York and L.A. And then the picture, you know, Warner was right on the picture. There's no question about it. Warner's was wrong. And Warner's was also wrong in a movie that we inherited called Billy Jack. Tom oh, Laughlin yeah. was in Billy Jack, and they did the same thing. They went exclusively in downtown areas, and Laughlin was screaming, why don't you go wide with this thing? It's that kind of a movie, revenge and, you know, all that. So he sued them. He sued Warner Brothers, and what he won in the suit was the ability to distribute it himself and see how he would do if it, if it in fact, went wide. We became his New England representatives, and I remember getting $1,400 a week for, like, 12 weeks to distribute this movie to wide in New England and theater owners lining up in front of our office to just buy it. So it was bad playing time. We went in May, but it was also the expense of Taylor Laughlin, which was Tom Laughlin's company to spend money in every, every market in television. So what would happen in New England is an example, Maine would cross into Vermont. The station in New York state would cross into Vermont. New Hampshire would get it. New Rhode Island. And so you had what is today's wide advertising back in 1974, I believe. And let me tell you that pound for pound, I guarantee you, Billy Jack did as much business as Bonnie and Clyde. They came, it came to life. People came out of the hills uh, and uh, it was a huge success. That was the early days of going wide, which is basically the distribution pattern of every movie today. Wide. Just go out there and get anything you can. Wasn't Billy Jack the first, the first real movie, and the first movie that really did mass TV ads? That TV ads were not common before Billy Jack. No, it wasn't. Oh. It wasn't Steve. It actually was happening in the late fifties with oh. AIP. They actually, the first two. person to do it was Joseph E. Joe Levine, Levine, Hercules with Hercules. Yeah. That's right. First person came up with the idea. He was a states writer himself in New England. That's right. And uh, formed Embassy Pictures, went over, saw Steve Reeves. He had a very high voice. He decided to bring it over and have someone dub his voice because it was a little too high. And, uh, well, we know the rest. We know the rest, my friend. You know, I don't, I don't know if I told you guys this story, Joe Levine. With Hercules, he gathered all of the exhibitors in New England because he was officed in Boston at the time. So in Park Square, everybody, all these hundreds of exhibitors came in from all over New England and they sat in, in the big ballroom and, and Joe rented a million dollars in cash from the Shamit Bank, which was 45 degrees, maybe 200 feet from the ballroom. And he rented it for like 30 minutes. So they wheeled over a million dollars in cash. They brought it in and he looked at all these exhibitors and said, you see this million dollars? This is what I'm going to spend on Hercules, just in New England, 
to make sure you do business with it. And he said, please get this thing out of here immediately. Because he didn't want to go beyond a half hour, which I think cost him like 20,000 bucks. Yeah. Well, he was a great promoter. Yeah. Let me just say quickly, Joe Levine eventually produced The Graduate, uh, The Lion in Winter. So he did a very lot of interesting things. We became very good friends. And when I started my radio show and we became syndicated, I begged him to come to Boston because his author said he was a hero in Boston. So my show was going to go on the air. We fly up to do the first show, and we the plane gets hit by lightning. Joe Levine grabs me, and he says, if I die for your Fakakta radio show. <laughs> he was a great promoter, and that, too, is some Mike Todd preceded him, I think. You're right. Great promoter. Uh, David O. Selznick was a promoter as well as a basic genius of what the hell movies were and what they should be. There has always been that kind of guy in, in, in the movie business, promoters, hucksters. I'll, I'll, I'll throw out a name from genre, uh, horror genre, William Castle. Yep. William Castle. Rosemary's uh, Baby. Rosemary's Baby. But I'll, uh, the movie that scared the heck out of me when I was a kid was a little exploitation movie called 13 Ghosts. And you, when you went into the theater, they gave you these glasses. The movie was not a 3D movie, but if you didn't want to see the ghosts, you didn't have to put the glasses on. But there would be a notice to put the glasses on to see the ghosts. <laughs> to this day, that's, let's see, 1960. So that's 64 years ago. Yeah. Uh, but the idea, exploitation departments at the studios were very active on those days doing everything they could to get the people to come to the theater. Those those type of stunts don't happen as much anymore. Uh, the stunts may not happen, but the uh, the advertising publicity machines uh, you know, kick a picture out there. You're going to see something this Sunday in the Super Bowl uh, where 30-second spots are going to cost $7 million. And you'll see some summer releases uh, films that will spend that $7 million to catch the attention of 110 million people. Which, or with Taylor Swift, there would be 125 million people, you know? So. On the other hand, we all could make a movie for $7 million. It's staggering. Andrew, do you know how much it costs to go to the Super Bowl, the first Super Bowl, a, a regular ticket? Do you know how much it costs? No. I guess. How much? $6. Oh, God, well. They said that the average ticket for this this past Super Bowl, this new Super Bowl... I think was something around eight thousand dollars, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, but it also, also for whatever it's worth, the Super Bowl wipes out the movies for the for Sunday. It just the business becomes no, it's nothing. No one goes to the movies. Everybody to be entertained will watch the Super Bowl, have their parties. It's funny how it go, it goes around because we all grew up with Milton Berle, and Tuesday night. Nobody went out. and that That's happened. right. That's right. So it, it happens every once in a while when an incredible thing happens. You know, I, I rarely go to the movie theaters anymore, sadly. But when I see the prices of the popcorn and the soda, I remember getting three Frankfurters, mustard and sauerkraut, an order of French fries, and a Dr. Brown cream soda for less than a dollar. <laughs> Was Abraham, I think Abraham Lincoln was president when that happened. Right. I think he was right after the assassination. <laughs> well, let's go back. Now, I want to go back to Roger Corman for a moment. Roger Corman, if you met him, you would think he would be a senator. Not today, actually. But he'd be a college professor. Roger was a really studious guy. Smart, really smart guy. Great filmmaker of the things he did. Uh, he came in. He got involved with a, a guy who owned rights from from Tokyo films or something like that. And they had these, these films, these, these black and white movies of people running in the rain. And that, that's all they had. Just Japanese people running in a rainstorm, you know? And they came up with the idea, Roger came up with the idea, well, if we put Lorne Green in the middle of it, as the announcer, they'll have the same thing as they had with Godzilla with, uh, was who was it? Uh, Peter Graves or? No, Raymond, uh, Raymond Burr. Burr. Raymond Burr. So they did that. And Roger came up with an idea to advertise this movie called Tidal Wave. They would use the picture on the box of Tide Cleaning, whatever it's called. Tide Cleanser. It's a wave. So that was the ad. The ad was this wave. 
But if you went to see the movie, you saw a lot of Japanese people running through the rain, but you never saw a tidal wave. <laughs> and the guy and Lorne Green would say, they're running now, it's coming, and the wave is going <laughs> to be a tsunami. This picture did business for one week. The word of mouth on it. Uh, you, you know, it, it's oh my funny. God. I think audiences have changed so dramatically over the years. In fact, we were having a discussion the other day is who puts tushes and seats anymore from the acting side? Are there any movie stars left? I mean, you could say Tom Cruise in the right movie. You could say The Rock in the right movie. But actors don't seem to be driving ticket sales. I think the concept is what driving. And by the way, Arthur, I like what you said about Roger Corman picture him as a senator. If you watch Godfather Part Two, yes. when Al Pacino is on trial from the Senate, one of those senators is Roger Corman. Well, when we were with Roger, we saw these guys running around in his office all the time. Uh, whoever the Francis Ford Coppola, uh, uh, Davidson, uh, these you know there were these Jonathan Demi, Peter Bogdanovich, Peter Bogdanovich, and Demi has had him in ever. I think Roger was in every one of, of Demi's movies. Right, exactly. He was, now, he was great for what he, what he looked like, you know. Julian, I'm curious, when you served your two years in hell at Paramount, mm -hmm. uh, basically you would go to these meetings and discuss, I mean, studios, my impression is it's all about meetings. I'm sure there were meetings where you're meeting with distribution, you're on the production side. Were, were there... Uh, were there arguments? Were, would distribution say, you're, you don't release that picture, don't buy that picture? Would there be a lot of, uh, of pushback, or did everybody feel like they were on the same team, were going for the money, what? Well, at the meeting, they might feel they were on the same team. When they were alone with their <laughs> they might not. I, what, a very strange thing happened. When I was at Paramount, I was there for, I guess, about nine, ten months, and the head of distribution, someone who Arthur knew well, Norman Whiteman, had to leave. He got ill, and he was going to be gone for a few months. And Barry Diller, who was running the studio, asked me to take over uh, distribution. And so I was the head of distribution for Marathon Man, King Kong, Black Sunday. And I took a movie off the shelf with uh, Jodie Foster with little kids <laughs> In gun uh, called what was it called now? If it is Bugsy Malone. Bugsy Malone. Thank you, thank you. I, it's good, Steve. You could be my subtitles. I I would like that. Anyhow, <laughs> uh, what happened at those meetings? Meeting where I was involved as the head of distribution, I'd have the marketing, publicity, and sales people, and I'd be at the head of the table. And I was fascinated by the fact that. If a film opened, let's say, like King Kong, which despite whatever you want to hear, was a huge profitable movie for Paramount. It 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 did not get great reviews, but it did huge business. Anyhow, everybody had great ideals how we could really get involved and promote and really hit it well. But if a film opened up on that Friday and we came in on Monday and got the grosses, you hear around the table was I never was in favor of that movie. I didn't think that was going to do anything. So it was exactly what I said to them. This is the opposite of what should happen. King Kong doesn't need you. It's taken off. This movie needs you. This is where you have to put your efforts. But it didn't work that way. And it, and I think Arthur could probably find the same thing out, too, at, when, at United Artists. It was a strange thing. Everybody wanted to be involved with the winner, and people ran away from so-called loser. It's probably general to almost anything. Uh, you know, it's the old, uh, everybody loves the winner. Everybody loves the winner. It's a good song, too. Uh, what is, Julian, I have a question for you. What would you say is the worst movie you ever saw that did a lot of business? Oh, my God. Let me count the ways. <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, I'm going to start. I'm going to start. Yeah, good. Popeye. Popeye was one of the worst movies I ever saw. And Popeye, for about a week or two weeks, did a lot of business because it was pre-sold. Robin Williams, and it, what a terrible movie that was, though. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely, I agree. Mm -hmm. I think they were they may have been really stoned making that movie in Malta, no less. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why they were stoned. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a, there's a phrase that refers to studio suits. They often refer to them as bean counters. They, they feel, some people feel that Hollywood has been taken over by people who aren't movie buffs or love movies like we all do, but just are interested in the money and the uh, the algorithms. 
and that there's no patience anymore. If a movie doesn't do opening business first weekend, it's gone. But it sounds like from what you're talking about, that hasn't changed over the years. That has not changed over the years. It, well, unless, it, it, unless you get someone like Warren who really fought for it. He, he came to me years later with McCabe and Mrs. Miller, which had opened and it died in two weeks. And he asked me if I would bring it back. And I said, "By well, this is crazy. I, I, how can I bring this movie back? It just died. And he said, I'll back it. I'll get money. I'll do this. I'll do that. And he convinced me. And I opened it at the best theater we had in New York, the Coronet. And by God, he did revive it for New York. I don't know if it got revived around the country. Arthur would it probably didn't. know better. It did not. But yeah. it certainly did in New York. Yeah, but New York, New York, of course, was always a, was always that incredible animal, you know, as is West LA and uh, certain areas around the country in San Francisco, Chicago, Boston. It's certain movies, you know. Look, we were dealing at a time when the play was the thing, as everybody would. The play is the thing. If it ain't on a page, it ain't on a stage. Well, we we were involved with a lot of movies that had a lot of dialogue, great story uh, that just are not being made today. Uh, because everybody is looking today who are making movies for all intents and purposes are looking at the entire global market, which is action, adventure, high concept, King Kong, Godzilla again, and just keep doing that kind of movie. Because as I've said before, uh, nobody's green lighting films today unless they think they can do business all over the world. Uh, and I don't think we do anything different. We might have a division for uh Story driven films. I would certainly want to do that for a minor amount of money compared to what they're spending on, on just marketing of the high concept films. But, uh, the distributor today does have a seat at the table for green lighting a movie. Uh, that I can tell you. They're part of a group that would sit around and say, should we do this, this, and this? That distributor got to know what his opinion. Will it do business? Because at that point, you're talking only about money. You're not talking about how good the script is. Who should be in it? You're talking about how much business is it going to do? Uh, and that's where a lot of people guess wrong. My God. Uh, yeah, you know, stories. The, the business is now dominated in many ways by the streaming companies, Apple, Amazon, Hulu, not traditional film distributors like Disney, Paramount, Universal. I'm curious you know, the, the thing with uh, the streamers is they will bring the movie into the theaters to start the ball rolling. And then eventually it becomes, and sometimes rather rapidly, it becomes a streaming title that leaves the theaters. Does that mean, Arthur, that the streaming companies have to keep a distribution department on tap for theaters, even though that's not their primary business? Oh, yeah, but when I, uh, not a whole bunch of people. Uh, they don't need more than a couple of people to address the situation. Today's world of computers, you don't really need salespeople going all over the country or living in different parts. You, you, you can do your stuff with a computer. So if, if uh, the owner of the streaming project wants you to say, let's get this out there so people know about it, and you want a 1,000 or 2,000, whatever amount of th theaters, uh, really a person can handle that from their computer. The exhibitor... The theater owner, you're not dealing with single screens. You're dealing with 12 plexes, 10 plexes. They need movies. So um, the streamer has, you know, it became a wave at first. It was the biggest thing in the world. It was the golden goose. And then all of a sudden, everybody said, well, they're all losing money. And I'm going to make a prediction right here that every streaming company that is good, has good organization, will make fortunes. Streaming is fantastic uh, to the consumer. Look at Disney right now. Their stock just went through the roof again because they figured out how to get back on the streaming thing and not spend so much money and blah, blah, blah. But the streaming business is really the business that brings in all of the story-driven movies today or episodes, a, a six-piece or a 10-piece or, you know, a miniseries. Uh, so that's where the so-called story-driven movie from theaters years ago like Silkwood or Tootsie or Kramer versus Kramer – they're going to the streamers. Whether right. they want to open it in theaters or not, that's their decision. In fact, someone once said that if the Godfather, if Coppola brought the Godfather out today, it probably would go to a streamer because it doesn't fit the mantle of a typical franchise movie. The studios seem to be obsessed with franchises, and it doesn't look like that's going to change much. 
Well, because this franchise is sustainable. They can look at it over a period of five, 10 years. It will keep doing business. And that's what they're, that's why they're, they're into that. You know, you mentioned the Godfather and Julian will attest to this too. The Godfather and Jaws had two things in, had one thing in common. Before they were released during production, they were looked at as oh, Godfather. It's too long. How can they put out a movie three hours? You, you heard that, Julian, correct? Oh, all the time off. And but- Jaws was the shark was broken. It's, it's a joke. Spielberg doesn't know what he's doing. He's too young. He's got a broken shark. They can't. It looks ridiculous. Wrong, wrong, wrong. So, you know, once you get into the world of distribution exhibition, everyone has opinions, myself included, Julian included. You have to. I mean, you're, you're basically looking at your gut instinct and uh, certainly in days gone by, should I play this or should I not play this? Uh, not everybody played a, a movie years ago. Again, you go back to you needed to bid for it. You need to be a special kind of a theater to play it. Today, you can be blind. You're going to play whatever the hell it is. You've got ten screens to fill. You're going to you're going to put put it in and 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 still guess wrong a lot of times as to whether a movie will do business or not. What we should point what we should point out about the streaming companies uh, is that their major goal is to get subscribers. That's right. what they're there for. It's not the same as it was with the studios. That I mean, certainly they wanted people to come in. But it's a different world, and that world uh, seems to say we don't want Kramer versus Kramer. You know, we don't want those kind of films. Well, you know, Julian, you're absolutely right. The the streaming business is based on subscribers. That's all they want. The golden model is Netflix. That is the most. That is when you think about it in the history of movies. That's got to be the greatest model of all time. People, they have 268 million subscribers paying $12 a month, every month. Talk about a sustainable business. Hmm. So they're, they're multi-billionaires and they're, they're making movies. They're making ep- uh, episodic movies. They're doing all kinds of things to keep that s- subscriber happy and to grow the subscriber market, which is also a global market. That's so again, right. now, now you say, so now you look at Disney and you look at, Paramount Global, or you look at this and that, they're all, they all look at that, that Netflix model. And that was a great conflict where all of these exhibitors, the retailers were very concerned a couple of years ago because with COVID, people fell in love with streaming. You're home and you put up the movie and you say to your wife, Shirley, where are we, why are we going to the theater? This is great. Well, here's, here. here's, here's, here's the, the bathroom, shut the, you shut it off and you know, here's the key question today is how many streamers can be in the marketplace. I mean, the move, the studios were all competitive, but it was a different type of competition. Uh, people went to, you know, people went to see every kind of a movie. Am I going to keep a monthly bill of nine streamers on my bill? I mean, can I handle nine streamers? Seems well, like well, there's already some pushback. Well, you may not necessarily nine, certainly have more than one or two, because what you're doing is you're canceling may perhaps Showtime or you're canceling HBO. You're canceling that. They're getting a lot of turnaround against pay television, which, of course, for years had everything going for them. So it continues to be a rather tough business, uh, except for one thing. Product is all a good product is always going to be uh, successful if you're lucky enough to get the right distribution. As Sumner Redstone said, Julian, content is king. That's right. One more thing. There is something called Sony Classic Pictures. There is a company that's been around for 30 some odd years doing intelligent movies, foreign movies, independent movies, and have been very, very successful. A lot of the studios tried, and some of them were able to get classic divisions, but no one's come close to the 30 some odd years that Sony has done. Yeah, they've, they've managed to do it because of Tom Barker and, and uh, you know... Uh, Michael Barker and Tom Michael Bernard. Michael Barker and, and, yeah. So, yeah, again, great management, great organization, will always conquer. Uh, but I want to just respond, Steve, to what you said about people just choosing. There are 8 billion people in this world, and it's growing. And let's say Netflix has 268 million of them. That leaves a lot of more people around. There's room for everybody. If you come up with hit product, they're going to want to see it. 
now sports has become king. And you see Warner Brothers, Paramount, and Disney, I believe, getting together to have you pay to see their sports things that they've got I, rights to. I think make sports a is keeping that. the broadcast networks in business. Because it is. Uh, they, they're, they're having trouble competing with the streamers for the kind of quality of product. I, I And Steve, you know, not only that, but when they buy the sports, they know just who they have to get for advertisers. Fast food companies, the beer companies, soft drink companies, and they stand online to get on there and they pay the price. So everybody makes money in the sports game. And we can't forget the fact that COVID made the streaming companies bigger and better than ever because people were afraid to go out, but they could still see their shows at home. And that right. was a big, big plus for the streaming company. Not and what happened, though, Julian, what happened was as soon as it came, as soon as they, the COVID thing happened and people were staying home, everybody was a boom for streamers. It was a boom. I mean, the movie, the theater business is going to go out of business. It was never going to go out of business. The theater business will always be in business for event kind of movies or, or, or social kind of things that people want to go to see. Teenagers, horror movies, they'll always be a theater business. But the kind of movie that adults like that we've discussed, the story-driven movie, has more of a, of a space in, at the streaming companies uh, because you're home and it's convenient and you don't have to go out and park and all the rest of that stuff. Uh, so there's room for everybody in the business. And now you're seeing a big comeback because of what's happening with Disney, with the rest of the streaming companies. They figured it out. You know, a lot of times you think that so studio executives are not so smart. That's not true. Most of them are pretty smart people. They know what they're doing. Uh, and they'll takes time sometimes. Julian Schlossberg once said to me, the movie business is like, is like politics. Uh, it's like government. It's like a brontosaurus. It moves slowly. And sometimes it makes these gargantuan mistakes and things that are so stupid. But what happens, I've seen in the history of, of, of my being in the business, sooner or later, they get the joke. And I mean, we start out with Vestron. They, they couldn't even think that you should own the rights to video cassettes. They was a company making money on buying the rights from the major film companies to distribute their pictures on video cassette. But then they realized, oh, my God, we should do it ourselves. And they made a zillion dollars doing it. So give credit where credit's due. The film companies know what they're doing. And if they don't, eventually they find out how to do whatever it is they didn't know what they were doing before. They'll have time and they'll do it. I would say this. The film companies historically have been on a delay. They've just right. been, <laughs> they t- took them a while, but they always jump in. They fought television like crazy, you know. I mean, they, <laughs> and then they gave all their movies to television. I mean, mistakes were made, but they are. I did say it, and I'll say it again: like a lumbering brontosaurus, they keep going along. <laughs> And they eventually knock everyone well, the other, out. The other thing that's oh, happening is consolidation. The big news in Hollywood right now is whether Paramount will be soon sold to a new investment group. And, of course, we know that 20th Century Fox was absorbed by Disney. It's m- merely a shell of what it once was, one of the great studios of all time. Uh, yeah, There's just... Uh, I, I'm i hoping that the studio business will continue, but they're certainly receiving a lot of pressure from streaming. But, of course, they have their own streaming services, too. Uh, I think Sony's the only one that doesn't have a TV network. They, that's a kind of a problem for them. That's no, I'll, I'll figure correct. that out, too. Well, you know, this has been an interesting. I mean, I, I've already come up with three topics we can do additional shows on. I mean, barely scratched the surface. The public at large, whoever's listening to this show, needs to understand when they hear the word distribution, it's really distribution exhibition. That's the same world. Many of the executives who are in distribution of the major companies came from exhibition. Many executives in exhibition came from distribution. So it's not production, distribution, exhibition. It's production, distribution, exhibition. It's one thing. It's really two pieces of pie. Yeah. If you've made it this far in our show, we'd love you to subscribe. That's our, our, our weekly plea. We'd love to have you on the team. And you actually have the ability to reach out to us and ask us questions and suggest show ideas. You can even be a co-host on the show if you've got a great idea. You can reach out to us at Tales from Hollywoodland at gmail.com. 
we're a two-way service. We provide you with entertainment, but you can also provide us with some great ideas. And the biggest news is that we are now on the YouTube channel. Uh, Tales from Hollywood has a YouTube presence, and we're so excited about it. You can just reach out. Just go on the YouTube site and type in Tales from Hollywood line. Our producer, Mike Faber, has done a great job in getting us into this new arena. Yay, Mike. Yay, Mike. Yay, Mike. Exactly. I thought you were saying your mic wasn't working. Sorry. I run into that all the time. It's okay. (laughs) We're on every platform now. We're on Spotify, Amazon, Apple. We're on all the platforms. We're coming into our own, and uh, we're having a ball doing this Mm -hmm. show. So, again, reach out to us, TalesFromHollywoodLand at gmail.com, or go to our YouTube channel. And just we're loving this. Right, guys? We're having a good time, right? Absolutely, Steve. Absolutely. Good and you time. Too. wish everybody a good have Super Bowl Sunday. Good and, luck. And thank you, Mike, for getting us on YouTube. And who's the guest on your podcast this week, Julian? This week is Richard Benjamin. And uh, we did a wonderful show. We talked about working with, oh, Walter Matthau and George Burns and Sunshine Boys. And he's just a wonderful guy. And, of course, he directed a film that Arthur distributed, My Favorite Year. One of the funniest movies of all time. I didn't distribute it. Excuse me. It was distributed by by United Art. Jerry Esben had that movie with my favorite year and also with Victor Victoria. And those pictures were not distributed properly. They were great movies, both of them. Lainey, Lainey Kazan talking to Peter O'Toole says, Swanee, because his name was Alan Swan. And uh, her son says, Mom, he's an actor, not a river. <laughs> <laughs> Great movies. As the temperatures get cooler, let's think back to a time where monsters fascinated our young minds, where haunted houses and flying saucers were the stuff of fantastical dreams. Come relive those wonderful times with us every Monday at 5 p.m. It's Monster Attack on the ESO Network. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping for the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek.